Hello, my name is Kimberly, and today I'm doing a presentation on Mikhail Bakhtin and his theory of carnivalesque. So what is carnivalesque, you may asking? Well, if you take a look at the word, at the beginning there is the root word carnival, and that leads to the question of what is carnival. And when we typically think about carnival in North America, we think about red and white tents, people running around everywhere, different rides and attractions you could go on, such as the carousel and the Ferris wheel, foods you eat like cotton candy, hot dogs, and games that people can play to win different prizes. But when you actually search up the definition of carnival, you are given two different definitions. The first definition is a period of public revelry at a regular time each year, involving processions, music, dancing, and the use of masquerade. And the second definition is the one we know of, a traveling amusement show or circus. Now, in the first image that I have here, this represents the first definition of carnival where people are wearing different costumes and masks in order to celebrate their culture through festivals and different festivities they would typically have dancing playing music going down streets it's more of a parade if we would describe it here in america as um what they're doing but they save this for a period of time in a year whether a couple weeks or days where they save it for these certain festivities and this is the one that we typically know of, which is the Ferris wheel and a carousel and people walking around. But this is what we know of as a carnival here in America. So if we look at both of these photos, you could pretty much describe them very similarly. And here at the top, I have a couple ways people would describe them. First, they would describe it as playful because you could pretty much mess around, have fun, and just go on different rides, meet new people. It's just an overall good time. And the second one is free, and the third one is mischievous. And by free, it's more like you could do whatever you want once you entered this space. Let's say you went to work and you had work and it was hard and you were busy and you had this one time day off and you go to this carnival. Here at this carnival you could pretty much do whatever you want and you wouldn't be judged by your boss, by anyone, and have the liberal freedom to do whatever you want there. Whether it's stealing popcorn, sneaking in, or just going on rides and meeting, like I said, meeting new people and and just doing whatever the hell you want. But yeah, it's also mischievous in that way because doing whatever you want could have certain consequences. Like when you were younger, you would sneak out of your house in order to go to a carnival with your date. Or you would just steal or sneak into the carnival in the first place without buying tickets. But that's an example of ways people could be mischievous. And overall, these festivities are entertaining, and it's a way for people to take their minds off of things that they normally have to deal with. So it's a very overall upbeat vibe, playful, happy, just overall. And this will become an important factor later on in my presentation of these descriptive words. Now, if we look at the textbook of what is carnival and carnival-esque, the definitions that happen is carnival refers to the popular feasts, festivals, and revelries of the Middle Ages. And carnival-esque describe those texts that embrace and embody the spirit of medieval carnival. Here I have an image of the popular feasts and festivals and revelries where they would celebrate together. And as you can see, it's a bunch of people that get together to eat, to play music, but it's not as colorful as what we had now. They're wearing their normal villager folk clothes. There's not as bright costumes. There's no rides everywhere. It's just music and food and people getting together. And it didn't matter what class you came from, whether you were rich or if you were poor, you would be able to come to these carnival and do whatever you want. You could be mean to the, the rich people. You could be mean to the poor people. It didn't really matter because you were at this place where it wasn't even a thing. So when it says Carnival S describes those tests that embrace and embody the spirit of medieval carnival, uh, the playfulness and the descriptive words that described before applies to the ways that people use Carnival S within Task. And I'll explain that later on more in detail through um, Bakhtin's different ideas. But before we get into that, we have to see who Bakhtin actually was. 
according um referring towards this theory. Uh, so Bakhtin was born in 1895 to 1975. He was born in Russia and a literary critic, philosopher, and scholar, although he preferred to be known more as a philosopher. He developed other theories besides uh, carnivalesque, like dialogalism, polyphony, chronotope, and heteroglossia, which are just some that he just um, developed on his own that he applied to text and used and can still be used in text today. And here are some primary works that he was involved in or produced, such as Toward the Philosophy of the Act, Problems of Dovesky's Art, and Robilus and His World. So in Problems of Dovesky's Art, he pretty much discussed Dovesky's texts and his books through different kind of uh, literal theories or literary theories. So in later works, he decided to add carnival-esque in the Problems of Dovesky's art, but he changed the name to Problems of Dovesky Poetics after he added carnival-esque and he published it. And he would study towards the focus of philosophy of languages, ethics, and literary theory, pretty much all he ever cared about. There wasn't any other interest in studies he was interested, such as art and stuff. But he was also in the school of Bakhtin Circle, which was a group of intellectual um, Russians, Russians, because he was specifically from Russia, so he only had the group of people from Russia, so I the intellectual Russians, that got together who talked about religious, political, and theoretical ideas together, and they bounced off each other and just communicated. And they also just talked about it, which is pretty much uh, what we would call a book club or a study group now. So Bakhtin's idea of carnival-esque is that they use the mischievous and playful spirit that I described before in my descriptive that a carnival possesses to mock authority, to change our relationships within power, and to emphasize people's bodies, laughter, and role play in order to try to perform a new world. Now, you have to think about this because carnival-esque is a period of time where people could do whatever they want, no matter who, authority doesn't matter. But remember, it's only a period of time. Eventually, carnival-esque has to pass over and it will come back to normal life. Like I said, for the job example, you would go to work and you'll go to the carnival, but eventually you have to leave the carnival and go back to work and live your everyday life like normal. So in this case, it celebrates equality, abundance, and freedom because it brings down power from authorities and kind of lifts up the people who had no power in the beginning. So Bakhtin believes there are a couple aspects of carnival-esque involves. So the first idea is folk humor, where they would pretty much are different ways that people mock authority, do power relationships, and you know the whole shebang but ritual spectacles such as pageants or comic shows as what we have now as comedy shows or um fashion shows where people go up and they're able to they're a specific standard i guess you could say for in the pageant industry where they pick who is good looking who is not who would win you know that kind of thing and comic shows for the idea of verbal, verbal making fun of verbally, and that could be explained through comic verbal compositions. So in comic verbal compositions, they're talking about different parodies, such as when Family Guy introduces uh, a scene from, let's say, Kill Bill into the show, or just a different other scene. I'm not sure of specific examples, but they have many, I assure you. And things like that, where they just play off the actual thing. And Bill's gating is profanity, cursing, insulting in order to create more humor. And overall, this creates a universal laughter where people can mock other people no matter what their status is. So if you were the king and you decided to come to this type of carnival-like vibe, you are able to be the subject of the laughter. People could make fun of you, do all this. Um, pretty much insult you if they wanted to and maybe you would kill them after but during the carnival probably not 
So continuing on, here is another aspect that Bakhtin believes is the core of a carnival-esque, and that is grotesque realism. And according to the book, the definition of grotesque realism is that it's an aesthetic of degradation or debasement through grotesque imagery and language. Lofty things are brought down to material while lowly or less privileged things are valued celebrated. And that's when they use the idea of something disgusting or something that doesn't belong or is not a part of what is considered normal to bring people down while bringing others up to become valued and celebrated unlike the people were before but this is aesthetics so continuing on grotesque body is the idea that any other body that's not considered the normal type of classical body where it's kind of refined and beautiful and nice to be gross and subject for this kind of target and that would be such as if I had a deformity in my leg where it's like hella huge besides my other leg, which is just normal, that would be considered grotesque. Or my back has a hump and just anything within those lines of abnormality. And that could be considered to our body types as well when we think hella skinny versus really overweight. Now, that's what we think about for a uh, grotesque body. Uh, secondly is objection where rules and things start not applying and it doesn't really matter. You can break boundaries and that's what objection is pretty much all about. If you have specific positions that you believe you can't cross, rules that you cannot break, as order that has to be there. If it's broken, if people decide to not follow it, if it gets objective, that's when objection comes into play. Now, uncrowning is when similarity used the idea of playfulness and mischievous in order to mock authority, which is kind of what overall grotesque realism and um, the whole idea of carnival-esque is about, mocking people. And the idea of uncrowning is that they mock authority in order to bring down specific figures that rule or controlling figures who believe that they are considered the bigger people than them. But by doing so, they people wear costumes or just make jokes of them, just bringing them down by, let's say, a clown wore a king's costume. People wouldn't really enjoy, like people would laugh about it, but the king would pretty much not enjoy it, even though it's during that time period. But Anyways, that's the idea of a crowning, and the king could also wear a clown's costume to mock how lower class they are, because back then clowns weren't really a high priority. Now, ambivalence is when a bunch of contradictory themes get together into one text, like life and death in one picture, or order versus chaos in one, and that has a very standstill. It's hard to identify for most people, but the idea of two things coexisting within a text or an image or anything is the idea of ambivalence, being able to coexist is what I would describe it as. So in my picture, I have the idea of imperfection is beauty, madness is genius, and it's better to be absolutely ridiculous than absolutely boring, which are pretty much prior opposites to the idea of uh, ambivalence, where Imperfection is beauty, madness is genius, and it becomes like a reverse while it becomes acceptable as well, an objection where these things become more acceptable in their society during this time. And I might go over 15 minutes, I hope not because points, but I want to get this <laughs> uh, off topic. Anyway, examples of Carnival-esque I have here is Cinderella and I say this because roles in their hierarchy becomes reversed because originally Cinderella was put to work by her stepmother and her stepsisters in their house cleaning do whatever they pretty much want of her she was a slave in their household but once she got the chance to become somewhat of a princess she left the king left her house to become this princess and that's how you know the role of her in her life even though it became permanent she 
became more of a princess while her family became just stayed commoners as they were. And I said mockery and ridicule, which applies to our uncrowning, because during a scene in Cinderella, people are destroying Cinder her family specifically, destroys her well made dress, making her look like she was gross or disgusting, and her dress was pretty much ripped up. And they were mocking how she can never go to this ball. She would always be in this specific thing to try to bring her down and make sure that Cinderella does not become someone of a governing figure so that they'd still be able to control her, which I think was the idea of um, uncrowning, although, yeah, they were not put in that position. And the last thing I would like to talk about for this example is Cinderella's step family. And in Cinderella's step family, I would say that they had the idea of grotesque um, realism or grotesque body, because this is pretty much all a part of the idea of grotesque realism, but grotesque body because they, her sister kind of had a really big nose compared to other, and if you look online they're referred to as the ugly stepsisters which is sad but you know that's how they're referred to and it's the idea of how they used the idea of how her big toe didn't fit in the slipper that kind of represents the idea of grotesque body compared to Cinderella's more slender figure and when Cinderella got beat up I think it also could be applied to the idea of grotesque realism even though her body was not disfigured in any shape way or form except for Cinderella's stepsisters or family where they have more deformities such as um molds or bigger noses and bigger feet just overall that kind of thing now, the second thing I would like to talk about, recently finished the Walking Dead series in comic form, really good, is The Walking Dead. And the reason why I'm using this as an example is because there are three things that I believe are key concepts that of are of Con Revel S. The first off is zombies. Zombies represent kind of a grotesque figure, as our textbook explained, maybe because their bodies are pretty much decomposing and conformed and just rotting so their faces aren't considered normal of course but you could see blood you could see all these nasty kind of disgusting things such as mucus or um, blood everywhere and it becomes an idea of grotesque body where it's considered disfigured and deformed because of all the broken limbs and all that stuff so the zombies make a huge aspect of carnival in my opinion the walking dead and the second thing is social hierarchy is reversed. So, like we had in Objection, there were laws previously before the zombie apocalypse started. There are laws, there are order. He was a cop, the main character, Rick. But all that changed once the zombies started coming, and people started changing, creating roles for themselves. For example, Rick became more of a leader rather than a person who just stand it on the side while well, there is also other people within the area who were also leaders and they were fighting for the right of the hierarchy and this is why i say social hierarchies reversed because the idea of how we used to have a common system transformed and changed to all for oneself and whoever had the, the role or felt like a leader was became became a leader no matter what status they previously had law wise or abiding wise and then the last thing i would like to say is it's life and death which is similar to our idea of ambivalence where they consider having multiple themes but the walking dead pretty much does not just have life and death because i say life and death since zombies are there and they're pretty much dead people while humans are there living their lives which is very contradictory and they're always fighting each other trying to save their lives while the other people are more serious you got chaos and order and that, that happens all the time whenever zombies take over take over a certain area and then they have to bring it back into the normal order make sure everyone understands what's safe what's not and it just goes back and forth and there's so many different ambivalent like themes within this comic i would say that it is pretty carnivalesque 
So those are my examples, and that was my presentation of Carnival Esque by Mikhail Bakhtin. And these are my sources that I've used for it. And thank you. Wow.